So I get what was your first impression coming to Cleveland? And he said some of your friends have like a wake up car and they oh. left Minneapolis. So okay. when I my first impression when I came to Cleveland, Cleveland at that time when I first came here in 1956, Cleveland was pretty much at its peak uh, in terms of economics. Uh, people were pouring into Cleveland every day to get jobs in the many factories that were here, the auto plants, the, all kinds of manufacturing, steel mills. Cleveland was a major destination city for people coming from other parts of the country, coming from farms, coming from small towns. You'd go to a place like Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago. And Cleveland was overcrowded. Uh, the black community was really jam-packed. Uh, the housing, much of the housing had been uh, chopped up into several units and people were living one on top of the other, but there was an exciting dynamic energy in the city that was really the result of having all these people coming in and making very big money in the unionized factories. And it just was a kind of exciting town to be in. On the other hand, it was um, not legally, but informally, a very segregated city, racially segregated. It just was understood you you were black. You probably didn't go into various restaurants, hotels, and places, and uh, on job. The job discrimination was just incredibly rigid. And uh, for instance. If you went into a department store downtown, and at that time, of course, all the department stores were downtown, you probably would never see a black clerk, or you might see one somewhere. And uh, the job discrimination was so clean. And in hotels, uh, only white people worked on the desk, the registration desk, or in any of the white collar level jobs. And what what I see as an example, of course, this was true all over the country and it certainly was really intense in Cleveland, but an example of what it was like was back then if you saw a friend uh, on the street and he told you he'd gotten a job at Sears, you wouldn't ask, well, are you in the shoe department or are you in hardware? What are you, what, what are you doing? You just knew he was a janitor. That was just automatic. Of course, now you run into him and he says that you don't know if he's a janitor, if he's a store manager. But when I came here, there, the, as I say, it was a very exciting, uh, energetic place. Uh, but uh, and, there, and there were there were restaurants, bars, mom and pop stores, everything on almost every corner. And of course, in those days, you could walk down the street if you were on a busy street, like 105th Street or 55th Street or something, where there were a lot of pavs and bars. There was always live music, always uh, people uh, on the streets. Um, so in that sense, it was interesting, but the job discrimination was very set. Uh, in the 1960s, I took a job for a time. I was going to school off and on, and I took a job with United Parcel, which uh, entailed sometimes going into a number of offices downtown to pick up packages. And I went in, uh, oh, I don't know how many offices. I never once saw a black person working behind the desk anywhere. It just wasn't done, you know, secretary, whatever. If you saw a black person, it was the, it was the janitor. And that's the way employment was. That's the way seg the uh, neighborhoods were quite segregated, although there were changing edge areas always. But the segregation was strong. The sense of white entitlement was just there in the air. There was just no no question about uh, what you did and what you could.
couldn't do the uh, I saw that break up finally uh, begin to really break. of course starting in the 50s and 60s America started gradually changing in these areas but the real massive change I saw occur in Cleveland with the election of Carl Stokes as mayor, the first black mayor of any major city. And his position was that no company could do business at City Hall uh, without showing that they do not discriminate in their hiring. And that uh, his policies just opened up enormous uh, jobs throughout the area and his practices, although he's you know, seldom given credit for this by urban historians I've read, but his practices were adopted throughout the country, as, especially as black mayors got elected. They all studied Cleveland, studied the pioneer and what happened and a lot of them consulted with them. The way Maynard Jackson ran uh, Atlanta for 16 years was based in a large extent to his observation of what happened in Cleveland, first under Carl Stokes, uh, and then he took the mayor of Detroit for 20 years, Coleman Young, definitely used Cleveland as one of his uh, ways of finding out how to be a mayor. Uh, Earl of Washington in Chicago was uh, had Carl Stokes as a consultant when he became mayor, and this was all over the country. So we, I, I didn't realize fully what was happening, but I was right at the uh, core of, of how uh, cities were going to change over the next decades. And it started here in Cleveland. So. Okay, um, so I'm around a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Funny thing, I uh, first met Carl Stokes before he became a lawyer. I was living in Minneapolis still. Uh, Carl came to the University of Minnesota to enroll in law school. At that time, the law school admitted students with only two years of uh, undergraduate education. So Carl went there to start law school. And uh, somehow I got to know him. My older brothers uh, were also, you know, going to school. I got to know him. He came to our house a few times. And, uh, we were, you know, we, we were casual friends. He was probably seven or eight years older than I am. I mean, we were not very close but we knew each other so uh that's when i first met him and then when i wound up i didn't realize i was going to move to cleveland but when i wound up in cleveland a few years later and i saw carl stokes was one of the really rising young black lawyers that he stood out from all the others in my judgment as far more worldly and uh, more focused than the other lawyers that were visible to me. Uh, and I remember telling people back in the, uh, say 1959, the person who has the best future in Cleveland is Carl Stokes. And they would look at me funny because he was just a, some other guy to the people who knew him well didn't see the distinctions. Well, I remember when I first came here, I took a job in a country club. And one day I was serving a table of these well-off white men who played golf and then sat around the table and spent the afternoon talking about this and that. And there was one liberal in the group who liked to rile everybody by saying something outrageous. And he said that, uh, you know, in 10 years, Cleveland's going to have a colored mayor. Everybody said, what? You're crazy. Of course not. And I remember hearing it, and I was thought to myself, he named somebody else who we thought might be qualified to be mayor one day. I remember thinking to myself,
so yeah we will have a black mayor in 10 years but it won't be him it'll be carl stokes so this was eight years before stokes was finally elected but yeah i could see that he had the mindset the skills the vision to do something and so he did it we did not have much contact however uh over those years and then when he got to be mayor and i took the job at the call in post we got kind of reacquainted we never got really close but i was always observing him uh, what he was doing from the late 1950s on through uh, the rest of his life except for the time he was in new york and then when he came back, he, he left, uh, after he left the mayor's office, and he moved to New York for 10 years. And when he came back to Cleveland, then we got very close. But yeah. Did you have any questions about him specifically? Or? Yeah, what did some white voters fear? Oh, what did white Stokes? voters fear? Yeah. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> what did white voters fear? I, I imagine they feared a lot of different things. Of course, uh, business community oh, naturally feared that they found ways to make their money and be successful with the way things were, and there was going to be change. So naturally, when you're successful, change is your enemy. <laughs> Sometimes. Uh, but the average white voter who was a blue collar worker I think they feared white, the loss of white privilege. Uh, I don't know how they would articulate their fears. For one thing, the stereotypes, I mean, we think there are stereotypes today. We think there is a lack of understanding today. Today is a period of supreme enlightenment, enlightenment compared to the way things were in the 50s and 60s. People had this mythology. They did not believe. I mean, I think the average uh, white person was always surprised to see a black person who was uh, not just articulate, but actually smarter than they were. Uh, because the, the stereotypes had been so ingrained in American culture throughout history. I think that they just saw that they would lose it, uh, whatever comfort they had. I mean, uh, I, uh, and with the police, the police had a, you know, their, their attitude was very often. Well, these folks are inferior and they have to be controlled and you put uh, put them in charge of things, and everything might break down. At least there will be change, and we will lose control when the change that takes place. I don't know. I think it was a subjective fear, to a large extent. It was real, because uh, when Carl Stokes ran for mayor, and as I said, the first time he ran was 1965. Then he ran again, and he almost won, and then he ran in 67 and won. But it was uh, it uh, the, the the white establishment and the white Democrats. Uh, there was no Republicans to speak of. The white Democratic Party was in power because of the way things were. They didn't want to see new people come up and take over because uh, everything would change. And uh, they certainly help foster the stereotypes, the fears, and say Cleveland will go to the, you know, go to the dogs if we elect this colored mayor. And so, when it came time to vote, the in it was either sixty-five or sixty-seven in the primary. I forget which. I think it was sixty-seven. The county chairman of the Democratic Party put out a notice to all of the precinct committee people telling them if Carl Stokes is elected mayor, that means Martin Luther King will take over City Hall. And that was the reason not to vote for Carl Stokes. Well, 
I think that kind of sums up what the attitude generally in the white community was toward the idea of black progress, a black mirror. Uh, Martin Luther King was the bogeyman to them. To us, he was the saint. But to the average one, he was a really dangerous person who would destroy the greatness of America. And his name was used to tell them why they shouldn't vote for Carl Stoke. That, that's the way the nation was then. I mean, they, the idea of Barack Obama, I mean, if you talked about him, he would have been arrested and probably taken to a hospital. But that's, uh, that was the attitude across the country and certainly here in Cleveland. And as I say, no other major city anywhere in America had ever elected a black person there, even in cities with overwhelming black population and enormous pool of, of uh, well-trained, brilliant black professionals. Nobody thought about um, electing a mayor, putting them in charge. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm curious about the uh, black city councilman, because I know in 65, some did it before Stoke, but it, of course they switched. So I was wondering, were you familiar with what their yeah. attitudes were and why they <laughs> did what they did? Yes, uh, to, to be a city councilman, any legislative body, you have to have the cooperation of your colleagues to be effective and do anything. Otherwise, you get cut off. Uh, if you're a councilman, you have to have some relationship with the mayor and the mayor's people or services, your, your services to your community being diminished and your people then voting out of office because you can't deliver. There were a lot of things going on. Plus, uh, and the real truth is there were some councilmen and always are, and unfortunately might even be today, who also uh, depend upon their getting along with the system to make more money than their salary provides them. So uh, the black city councilman, at, at the time when Carl ran in 65, there were 33 councilmen, eight of whom were black. Uh, they, in order to function as councilmen, had to have made some kind of relationship or accommodation with the administration and with the majority on city council. Uh, that majority definitely did not want Carl Stokes as mayor. They did not want uh, any change because things were set up and, you know, they, they, they were doing well with the status quo. And their people, of course, their constituents could not understand why anybody would support a black candidate for mayor. Uh, so when Carl ran in 65, the black councilmen had a problem. I mean, they do they give up all their connections and all of their relationships with the administration? in order to support Carl Stokes, and then they'll be outsiders for the rest of their career, their lives, maybe. Uh, seven of them stayed with the administration and opposed Stokes. There was just one of the eight who, uh, and he was from the lowest income community in Cleveland, and he came out for Carl Stokes, but he was the only black councilman to do it in 65. Well, of course, their constituents went just overwhelmingly, you know, 90% or more for Carl Stokes. And by 1967, when he ran, most of them saw, well, I can't survive if I go against my constituents again. So they uh, switched and supported Stokes. And uh, the... There were a few who didn't, who were so cemented in their community, they could kind of separate. Uh, they, they could be, had kind of a schizophrenic approach to their politics. Their people liked them, they were well cemented with their voters. And so they could disagree on this one thing, I'm not going with Stokes. 
but I'm with you every all the rest of the way. And about four of them got away with that in that election. Well, I say they got away, but two of them then got thrown out of office in the next election. So I don't know if they really got away. Four of them attempted it. But uh, that, uh, that was why I think they did not support Stokes the first time he ran, and they felt they had the support of the second time he ran. Mm -hmm. Of course, when I say four of them did not support him, by that time, the number of blacks on council had expanded. I don't remember how many. So most of those who opposed him before supported him when he ran again. And he became mayor. I'm not sure if he was on the city council, but um, were they, they were supportive of him when, when he was actually mayor in terms of passing oh. those initiatives? Now that's now the thing is when Stokes became mayor, the city council, of course, was still overwhelmingly majority white. The council president had to be totally opposed to Stokes and try to damage everything he tried to do. Uh, and these four councilmen stayed close to the council president. That was their only refuge, you know. They they couldn't, uh, no, they didn't get close to the mayor, but they did. Well, I'll take that back. Uh, George Forbes was one of those who had opposed him in '65. When he got elected in '60, well, he supported him. George Forbes supported him when he got elected in '67. The four who didn't support him, they they kind of they they were heroes to the white community, and. Uh, I know one or two of them were elected county judges where they could get an overwhelming white vote. Mm -hmm. And that's how they got out of council. But uh, a couple of them that never got close to the mayor got defeated in the next election. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was a, it was one of those uh, moments where you had to make the decision that go this way or that. And, those who made the wrong decision either had a, an escape hatch or they, they fell by the wayside. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I know so one of the Stokes' uh, biggest issues as mayor was reforming the police department. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, what, do you know what his relationship was with the police? I know the Glenville shootout, they refer to him as like the N word, very on the slur. Okay. Charles Stokes and the police. So, like, he wrote later, he thinks that no mayor really controls the police. He only has an accommodation with them. And uh, the police were probably the most uh, uh, obvious bastion of real white racism in the community. I mean, that was their culture. That's a culture they were trained into if they didn't have it when they got on the force. Uh, so, uh, when Carl, they, they, they fought very hard against Carl Stokes becoming mayor. They did not want him to become mayor. I mean, they're those who were in positions to speak out and show their hand. Uh, he got elected mayor. I knew one detective, one white detective who said he would resign if Carl Stokes became mayor. Well, Carl got elected. He didn't resign. He found some other way to accommodate themselves to it, but they were always hostile to him. Yes. And the way it was in Cleveland under the charter, the mayor could not give any orders to the police. He could only give orders to the chief and no one else. And uh, they would justify the chief if they didn't like what he had to say. Um, so yeah, they were very much against the mayor. And then the Glenville shootout occurred. Three policemen were killed in that shootout. That, of course, brought their hostility to the surface like nothing ever before. It, I remember after the shootout, uh, the assumption was that the next night in Glenville would be far worse. These uprisings historically are always more intense the second night. And the assumption was that the police would be there 
ready to kill anybody and everybody. A curfew was declared, I guess, but uh, the police were going to be a real problem with their emotion and hostility. A number of community leaders met downtown at a hotel a block from City Hall all day long trying to figure out what to recommend to the mayor be done. They finally proposed to him that he keep black policemen out of Glen or white policemen out of Glenville the next night to prevent a bloodbath. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, Carl Stokes did issue that order that no white policeman could come into Glenville. That has to be unique in American history, where white policemen were barred from an area, and especially, of course, by a black mayor. I don't, I've never heard of it happening again anywhere. It was probably the single most courageous act by Carl Stokes in his uh, term as mayor. The white police then were in their cars. They were on a, they ringed Glenville with their cars, but they couldn't come into the area. They had, there was only one radio channel and on their police radio all night long. They were the racial slurs against the mayor, against the black community that they kept broadcasting all night. But what Carl Stokes did was instead of, uh, he took the recommendation of these community people. They got volunteers to come into the community if they didn't already live there, wear orange armbands and walk the streets to try to keep peace instead of having police come in. The, uh, they did that. And there was activity the next the night. There was some looting and burning. But uh, it was less than the first night, far less. And no one was killed. I don't know if anyone was injured. If, if people would call the police and say there was something going on, they would say, tell your N-word mayor that or something. But uh, black police did come into the area and were there to provide what official police presence was in the area, but the volunteers, the community volunteers, more than a hundred of them, just walking the streets, were able to get the community through the night. Uh, by the next day, the National Guard was in town and the police were allowed black get back into the area. But I think that one night of cooling off uh, would have probably saved any number of lives. I, because there would have been a real massive war going on had they come in that night. So they never forgave Carl Stokes for that, the police, and they were always hostile to him. Uh, Carl Stokes tried to do a number of things with the police that were innovative. Uh, one of the things for promotions, the way the police operated, uh, they always went by test score. And the your top on the test, the uh, top person gets the promotion. Uh, these promotion, these tests were based strictly on police procedures. Carl Stokes uh, had the Civil Service Commission develop a new test that was based not simply on police procedures, but also on understanding of the community. And they were required to read some books of sociology and history to understand the history of Black people in America. And they, remember the uh, sociological book, um, Crisis in, oh, geez, I can't remember, by a man named Silverman, Crisis in Black and White or something like that. But that was the, top racial sociology book recognized by colleges around the country. They were forced to read that. They would be tested on that. The police protested like crazy. What's this got to do with catching a bank robber or something? But the idea was they, he tried to crack open the sensitivity. And that didn't work very well. Although I did hear some policemen actually would admit privately 
that it was the best thing that ever happened to them in their careers because for the first time they gained some insight and understanding of the areas they were patrolling. Before that, they'd never had any experience and any education to tell them why people had the attitudes they had. Uh, but that didn't last long. And he tried other innovations. Uh, he changed police chiefs. He uh, brought in safety directors. Uh, in 1969, when he ran for re-election, the police came up with a very novel and I'd say frightening gimmick to try to defeat him. Uh, he was facing a uh, white Republican, uh, Ralph Perk, and the idea police wanted Perk to win because he was white. So there was also an issue on the ballot, a very innocuous in this context issue, statewide issue on whether uh, the voting age should be 18 years old. At that time, it was, you had to be 21 to vote. So they put the 18 year old vote on the ballot. That was, I mean, that happened to be on the ballot. So Cleveland policemen who were off duty were able to register as vote watchers for the 18 year old ballot issue. And, but people could see their guns. They would have their guns on and going into polling places and let their jackets come open where voters could see, and they would challenge people. Well, word of that got out. They started in the morning doing that. And when word of that got around town, that angered so many people that they probably increased the black vote further than intimidated. But that was done by Cleveland policemen as one of the gimmicks they used to try to upset Carl So say it's so frightening because now I think we face a national danger of having armed policemen in polling places, checking people's uh, credentials and it's uh this will mean people won't vote you know very simple they won't want they'll be scared to uh so all they carl stokes uh faced all that kind of hostility from the cops finally he thought he was going to pull the rabbit out of the hat in 1970 he came up with the biggest gimmick of them all uh the top black hero of world war ii General Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. was finally uh, being retiring from the Air Force. And when uh, word came out that General Davis was retiring, Carl Stokes flew down to Florida to meet with him and offer him the job of safety director of Cleveland. Well, Ben Davis had graduated from high school in Cleveland and I guess he didn't have any job lined up. He'd been in the Air, or the Army and Air Force for 33 years, West Point graduate, all these things. And as I say, he was the best known black hero of World War II, head of the uh, commanding officer of the original Tuskegee Airmen. And uh, I even knew about him, a kid in grade school in Minneapolis. I know who he was. That's how big he was, too black people and so bringing him in was a, a master stroke carl thought i remember when the word came out that he was going to get general davis my immediate reaction was that it's the worst mistake he's ever made in life because one uh, I, I had two reasons that i thought it and i did i i used to eat with a lot of uh, black professionals have lunch with them, doctors, lawyers, and, as well as people on other kinds of jobs. But we had a round table where we would show up for lunch. And when I said, hey, this isn't going to work, and they all said I was crazy. I mean, I was, it was almost blasphemous for me to say that General Davis won't come into town and straighten everything out. But my thinking was, uh, one, Davis had thrived in the officer's corps at a time when the officer's corps in the, the late 40s and 1950s probably was the leading repository for 
white supremacist and racist. You know, most of the officers' core was from white, uh, you know, white Southerners. And the fact that he found ways to function with them suggested to me that his social philosophy was not the same as Carl Stokes. The other thing was, of course, there's no way a general, a man who spent his entire adult life in the military, can walk into a city hall anywhere and, and not be maladjusted. Uh, he, he had been in a position where whenever he walked into a room, everybody stood at attention until he told them they could sit. And when they spoke to him, it was always uh, with deference. They opened doors for him. And all of a sudden, he's going to go into the rough and tumble Cleveland City Hall where if he tells somebody to pick up some paper, he'll say, that's not my job. <laughs> you know, I, I knew it, it just wasn't going to work. I thought this is going to be a bad idea. As I say, I was vilified for suggesting that possibility. But uh, it was a very short time that so it wasn't going to work. Amazingly, the white police loved General Davis. He was their best leader they ever had. He was the safety director. And when uh, he told the police chief what to do, of course, the chief would do it. The patrolmen would stiffen up. They would come to attention when he came around. He was their ideal for what they looked up to, the complete military man. And he had this great military bearing. Uh, but he, of course, would not bend to go to cabinet meetings and be bothered with the little mundane housekeeping matters of the city in general. He was in charge of the safety forces, and that was his role. And he wasn't going to let a little short-term enlisted man like Carl Stokes give him orders. I mean, that, that couldn't work anywhere. So, uh, with just a few months in it, it was becoming obviously unworkable. And when Carl Stokes, you know, he was stuck with him, didn't know how to, what to do. And General Davis did what military people do. He, you give him a problem and he'll come up with the military solution. He was ordering ammunition for the police force. And so he ordered 40,000 dumb, dumb bullets. And, you know, kind of tear the body apart when they, they're, they're not civilian, they're, they are military uh, weaponry, they are not for civilian use. So uh, that was leaked to the call and post. And the publisher told me that. He had ordered these bullets, go down and interview him and ask him why, which I did, and did the story that he had done this. That was what Carl Stokes needed to get the community work up to show that General Davis was not a good fit for being in the government. And uh, that kind of brought things to a head. And all of a sudden, people turned on General Davis, people who had been his admirers all their lives turned on him, and uh, finally he called a news conference at which he announced he was resigning. And when he was asked why, he said that Carl Stokes gives aid and comfort to the enemies of law enforcement. When he was asked who they were, he said he wouldn't say anything else. And when reporters said, but this is such a severe statement. You have a responsibility to say what you're talking about, smearing everybody. But he just walked out. He didn't say any more. Never had another word to say about it. And uh, Carl Stokes uh, listed all the people that he said uh, General Davis had complained to him about, and on that list were some of the most prominent black people in Cleveland. And, uh, I'm not talking about the militants or anything. I mean, black professionals. Apparently, everyone who disagreed with him was an enemy of law enforcement. At least Carl Stokes said these are the folks he complained about. And that kind of uh, pulled his coals out of the fire. 
Carl Stokes had the sympathy of much of the community in this rebuild. Uh, but I noticed years later when General Davis came back in town to give a speech or something not connected with any of these civic issues, uh, and I happened to cover, and I noticed that uh, the suburban white who were there, they loved him. They, they just couldn't understand how Cleveland let him get away. You know, I was thinking, the breach here and understanding of what the issues are and what the values are is so tremendous. You just don't know what's, what the reality is. But anyway, that that's a long answer to your question of Carl Stokes uh, mm -hmm. and the police. Yeah, the hostility was there from before he got elected to after he left City Hall. Um, so I have one more question about Carl Stokes, and I want to kind of jump into other stories you okay. covered. So. Yeah, someone who saw his rise and observed his administration, are there aspects of his legacy that you think go unacknowledged? His legacy? Mm -hmm. Well, as I said earlier, of course, his pioneering of how to uh, deliver services that generally were undelivered in the past to the black community was uh, it had national implications. It had, uh, it was copied nationally. I think that his breaking the ice here in Cleveland, becoming the first black mayor of a major city, even though you would think on paper, Chicago, Detroit, some other cities had far more history and resources in preparation for that job. Uh, his doing it here in Cleveland I think opened up the flood of black mayors in major cities across the country. And all of a sudden, local politics became a real uh, important feature of cities, of that black participation in politics because of Carl Stokes showing that on a local level you can be effective and how important it was all over the country i think that black people got far more involved in urban politics uh, that built and built until when barack obama ran for president the ground had already been fertilized prepared uh, for people to really turn out and to be prepared to elect him. I, I, quite as pure speculation, of course, but I wonder whether he could have been elected in 2008 if Carl Stokes hadn't been elected here in 1967. I think that's perhaps one of his legacies. Uh, on an individual level, the single most important legacy of Carl Stokes being elected mayor was all of a sudden the job he had really wanted but uh, never got opened up, which was a congressman from Cleveland. Because of redistricting and court orders and so on, right after the year after he got elected mayor, Cleveland was going to elect the first black congressman from Ohio. And since Carl was not available, his brother Lou got elected. Well, Lou Stokes was never a politician before. I think Lou Stokes turned out to be such an extremely important congressman because Lou Stokes and the few other blacks that went into Congress with him uh, decided we've got these, there, there already were maybe a half dozen black congressmen when he went to Congress, but the new one said, you know, these guys are all competing against each other. We need a black caucus. And so because of Lou's leadership and, and the others like Clay, Shirley Chisholm and all, they forced all the congressmen to form a black caucus. And the caucus didn't know what to do once they got it. The first term, it was just kind of spinning its wheels. But for the second term, they elected Lou Stokes as the leader, even though he was so young, so new to Congress. 
he became the chairman of the caucus and he insisted that all of the major committees put black people on them. They'd been steered away from seats on these committees. Uh, Lou went on appropriations, Ron Dillon's on defense and so on. And they became a real force in Congress because of the pattern that Lou laid out while he was chairman of the Black Caucus. Uh, so, and, and, and then on appropriations, he was able to affect so many, many, many programs and agencies across the country by insisting, as Carl did in the city hall, by insisting that all the agencies that came before his subcommittee had to demonstrate they did not they did not uh, practice discrimination and say what they're doing to fight it. And as a result, so many jobs, so many contracts, and so many programs uh, angled toward the black community were developed under his pressure. So that was one of that was maybe the single most important. Uh, well, the election of, of Barack Obama and the election of Lou Stokes as congressman, I think, were Carl Stokes' two greatest legacies. Okay. Um, yeah, another story, I did not know this until we talked yesterday, the McDonald's boycott. Oh. Yeah, I did not know anything about that, but I was curious about what, what exactly what was it and what was the um, outcome of the boycott of McDonald's? Oh, the McDonald's boycott? <laughs> That occurred in 1969 when Carl Stokes was mayor. And it was discovered, uh, some activists discovered how much money McDonald's was taking out of the black community. There were four McDonald's restaurants in Cleveland's black community. And of course they were getting all the business prior to their coming along. You know, we had mom and pop little hamburger shops and restaurants and they were really, the money was shifting to McDonald's. The McDonald's franchise was owned by people nobody ever heard of, you know, white investors. Uh, a black man tried to get a franchise and he applied to McDonald's. They turned him down. He said it was racial discrimination. He went to a local man who had a radio program. He was a popular preacher on the air. He was a very militant guy. His name was Bishop Hill. And so he said, thought, well, he could make some money on this. And he took up the matter and he started broadcasting that McDonald's is discriminating against the black people by not selling franchises. And he called for a boycott of McDonald's. Well, there had been others who had been looking at that too. And so the it just took off. The community really got behind the boycott. And it was a major thing that kind of overwhelmed the community. The black nationalist organizations got involved. And they provided uh, pickets wearing uniforms, colorful uniforms at the McDonald's restaurants. And they were trained uh, to be polite, not to be abrasive or anything. But if somebody tried to walk into McDonald's, someone would walk over to her and say, uh, we're trying to boycott because they won't sell franchises to us. Would you please uh, not go in? And McDonald's was effectively shut down. The restaurants were open. They were ready to cook hamburgers and had the crews on in, inside, but nobody was buying anything. It was extremely effective. Uh, it, it got a lot of publicity, and uh, Bishop Hill's name somehow changed in this process to Rabbi Hill. I don't, but since he was independent, he could, of course, promote himself to whatever position he wanted, I suppose. But uh, anyway, there was a uh, Finally, an agreement was reached. McDonald's had uh, leading uh, corporate law firms in town representing them, and there were discussions. The W.O. Walker, the publisher of the Call and Post, was very much behind the boycott, and the boy the committee leading the boycott would meet at the Call and Post every Saturday morning, and. and uh, 
plan what was going to be done next. There was all the civil rights organizations were involved. NAACP core was very big in town. They were involved and others, the black nationalists. So uh, finally, uh, and I think, and, and of course this was a very national, the interest was national. Uh, the corporate community, Wall Street, was watching this very carefully. Finally, a uh, decision was made that all black, uh, all fast food franchises in the country would start selling, I mean, all fast food companies would start selling franchises to black business people in black neighborhoods. They reached that agreement. However, it seemed to have been important to also send someone to jail to put a stop to this. They didn't want this kind of mechanism spreading. So uh, there was a grand jury investigation of the boycott to see if there was extortion and what laws were broken. Well, there weren't really any laws broken. And uh, one reason the boycott was successful, I think, was because uh, Carl Stokes was mayor and he was able to issue the order to the police. They cannot interfere with the picketing unless they saw an actual <laughs> crime being committed. And so the police were kind of held in check. And I, I would believe, my, my own guess is, that had the previous mayor still been there, then the police would have gone in and broken up the picket lines wherever they could. But anyway, it didn't happen. That's my speculation. Um, but still, there was the the investigation by the county prosecutor and all of the information that was gathered was presented to the grand jury. Grand jury came back with indictments against seven people, which included uh, W.O. Walker uh, for his role in this and the leading ministers and others. Really, most of the seven were very prominent people and to say that they had committed these crimes, they, they, the crimes were very nebulous and so on. Uh, the story is that when these, this list of indictees was presented by the foreman of the grand jury, presented to the presiding judge to sign, he took one look, dropped his pen and said, get that out of here. I'm not going to indict these people and take it back. And uh, the grand jury went back in session. They came up with the indictments of the two most vulnerable people on the list, which were uh, Rabbi Hill and his uh, associate, Jim Raplin. They both were very shady characters, and I'm sure they, they didn't get the opportunity to violate the law during, during the boycott because it was a community effort. But I'm sure there were many other things they could have been caught up on legitimately. But be that as it may, they were indicted. Uh, <clears throat> there, uh, and this did not get the kind of community outrage and concern that the indictments of the other prominent people would have gotten. And then their trial uh, was is the only one in the history of Calgary County that was uh, granted a change of venue. Their lawyers asked for it, knowing they would not get it. The judge fooled them and gave them a change of venue, sent the case down to Canton, Ohio, where they got an all-white jury, and uh, they were convicted. Uh, well, pending, they, they appealed immediately, and they were on, you know, they were on, on the streets pending con uh, the appeal, Rabbi Hill then immediately fled the country, went to Guyana. Uh, Jim Raplin stayed around and he went to prison. Well, even though I'm convinced I was a fairly close observer of the boycott and everything that was going on, and, and plus I observed the trial very close. I even spent a day down there watching it and following it closely. I'm personally convinced that they had no crime that he committed in this case, uh, but he spent uh, several years in prison because of it. And uh, that's why I assume they 
corporate community felt they had to get their pound of flesh for this dangerous precedent to spread. But the result of it was it created a number of black millionaires in cities throughout the country. Suddenly, these fast food franchises were available. I know several years later, a uh, McDonald's owner and he was speaking in Cleveland, he was asked a question about what the boycott meant. He was in New York City. He said that the McDonald's boycott in Cleveland created at least 15 black millionaires in Manhattan. And if you spread that around the country, you see the enormous significance of what happened here in Cleveland. And once again, I ask about the legacy of Carl Stokes. I'm not sure what would have happened if he had not been mayor of Cleveland. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a, I never heard of that. <laughs> oh, yes. um, the good history they try to keep from us. <laughs> <laughs> Just the bad stuff they don't like to talk about. There we go. Okay, so my name is Aaron Fountain with the Cleveland Restoration Society. Today is August 25th, 2022. I am with Richard Dick Perry in Shaker Heights, um, Ohio. And nice to see you again. <laughs> Hello, welcome back. Welcome All back. Right. So I have. Plenty of other questions and things I wanted to know uh, more about. So it's going to be just kind of random all over the place. Carl Stokes, education, mm -hmm. uh, housing, and uh, churches. Yeah. So, yeah, my first question is, uh, yeah, can you talk about Stokes' attempt to create public housing in the Lee Seville neighborhood and the opposition from Black City Councilmen? I know you wrote an article about that. Yeah. So when, uh, yeah one of the Carl Stokes' big uh, efforts was to build more public housing for people of low income. And he picked an area that was undeveloped and old, well, it was an old factory area, but now it was vacant and he wanted to build a project in what they call the Lee Seville area of Cleveland. And that was adjacent to Lee Harvard. Well, Lee Harvard was a very, upscale area for the black community in Cleveland and you had all the, so many young black professionals moving their families there and it was considered the most desirable area or one of the most desirable areas of the city and they did not want to it turned out the residents in Lee Harbor did not want uh projects for low-income people to be built right where they had invested in their homes, in their family homes. And uh, it turned out the councilman out there, uh, George White, was a sort of leader. He was a very conservative guy who was never on Stokes' team, one of the few black councilmen to uh, never support Stokes anyway, and he was a close ally of Jim Stanton, the council president who opposed everything Stokes tried to do. Uh, but George White was a very honorable guy. He took care of his ward, and, and he had a very loyal following. So the people who had gone out to the polls to vote for Stokes overwhelmingly and rejoiced in his winning, they were still for Stokes, but they said, no, uh, you can't build the project out here. They, they instead followed their councilman's lead in opposing it. And it became a very big battle, kind of a battle of words. And there were town hall meetings and that kind of thing. And uh, where he would try to present it and residents would get up and speak against it. And... I know I was at one meeting, uh, the Lee Harvard Community Association, or whatever it was called, and they said, uh, you know, they, they were there, this was their annual meeting of the community, and uh, the people were all dressed up, all the men had best suits on, and the women had the furs, uh, that time they even in the summertime, women had their fur stoles or whatever they wore around their necks. So this was really a upscale crowd putting on their best. And 
Carl Stokes was a speaker. He had him in the palm of his hand talking about anecdotes uh, from the old days and even mentioned people in the audience that he knew uh, when he lived in the projects and they lived in the projects in the inner city. But uh, still, when he got through, and then he, he did all that to lead into saying how he wanted to give people the same chance with the Lisa Bill project. And uh, it didn't go over. And those folks would not budge on that. I talked to some of them, and their attitude was, when we started out with no money, we lived in the projects, and we were able to work hard and, and move away, and I believe others should do the same thing, but uh, it's not that they're against helping people, but there's one, now that they have this nice neighborhood, nice homes, they did not want it, uh, the character of it changed. And so that, he took a defeat. He never got the projects or never got built. But that, yeah, that was one time you had the very liberal black community that loved Carl Stokes still say, no, not in my backyard. We're all for it, but not, not here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was that was quite a defeat in its way for him. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it's another question about Stokes. Um, how exactly did Stokes manage to get legislation passed that ban, or that bar the city from doing businesses with companies that practice racial discrimination? How did he get the legislative legislation passed. Well, the way he describes it in his uh, autobiography was he knew this was, this legislation was pioneering. There had never been anything like it anywhere in the United States. And he knew that he did not have the votes on city council. He had to, because the majority uh, of councilmen were whites who could not vote for things that were overtly helping the black community like that without paying for it at the polls. There were a few white supporters that he had, but he could not get it through council ordinarily. And in his book, what he says happened was the president of council came to him and wanted to uh, aid one of his benefactors who had all of the taxi cab licenses in the city. And he wanted an increase in the number of taxi cabs. And he asked Stokes quietly, uh, can we get this legislation through to increase the cabs? And Stokes says he then pulled out the legislation to uh, open all jobs and all to, to uh, we make sure that there's non-discrimination and that there's an effort to hire black people. He said, well, I'll trade off you pass, I'll, I'll okay the cab legislation, I won't be able if you pass this. Uh, well, the legislation got passed uh, through council with no questions asked, no controversy. I know when I went to council that night and I looked at the pending legislation and I saw this piece was introduced, was going to be introduced as emergency legislation that would not have any uh, debate or would not have to have multiple readings before it became law. And I said, well, there's no way, this is fantasy. There's no way it will uh, get passed. And it sailed through with no questions asked. I think it was a, what it is that with the emergency legislation, the clerk of council would read off a whole series of emergency ordinances and they would pass on one vote with just a lump, uh, you know, they would all be amalgamated together and passed with a single vote. And this was included and nobody got up to say, take that out. We, you know, we take that separately. I was amazed that it got through, but apparently what Stokes said was that in his book that the council president gave him the word not to question it, just to vote for it. 
there are uh, other rumors that it really wasn't about taxi cabs. It was about something else. It was about land development, uh, or someone wanted to invest in land and wanted rezoning to make that possible. But uh, either way, it, uh, when uh, the point is that it, Stokes had the legislation, it was dream legislation that nobody thought would, he could ever introduce, and he managed to get it through and set a pattern that was followed around the country. Most notably, uh, Mayor Maynard Jackson in Atlanta used the legislation that Carl Stokes got passed opening jobs in building uh, the Atlanta airport, the, I guess it's one of the busiest in the entire world. And uh, that was famous for when it was being built for the participation of black workers, black contractors and all. It was totally unprecedented anywhere in the country. And it was patterned after what started here in Cleveland. And in fact, Maynard Jackson hired key people who had worked in the Stokes administration, including enforcing this legislation. He hired them to move to Atlanta and join his administration. And uh, I don't know how much or what parts of it were followed in other cities, but that was the biggie. Mm -hmm. I thought there were other cities that. I beg your pardon? I mean, Atlanta's the main one, but there were other cities that adopted the same policy. Well, every, virtually, yeah, yeah. There were, uh, once Cleveland elected a black mayor, all of a sudden, People were energized around the country and city, major cities started electing black mayors, you know, one after another after another. And uh, all of that first generation of mayors, uh, to my understanding, paid close attention to the Stokes experience in Cleveland, how he got elected and how he governed and what he ran into. Uh, Coleman Young in Detroit, when he became mayor, he spent a lot of energy and effort in studying Stokes' relations with the police, for instance, in order to uh, know what to expect in trying to gain some control over the police force in Detroit. When Harold Washington ran for mayor in Chicago, uh, Stokes was, uh, of course, Stokes was out of office at that point, but he was a close advisor and close friend and help. And then all over the country, uh, you know, Cleveland had done it first and therefore they had to study what happened here. And that kind of legislation, uh, I don't know how many cities it was actually passed in, but it certainly had to have been a factor in many of them. I know it was in Atlanta and I think it was rested. In fact, uh, once Carl got elected, he, uh, had uh, kind of an informal uh, national coalition of, of leading, you know, the urban leaders and congressional leaders, the black urban leaders and congressional leaders that would get together sometimes at his house in Cleveland in order to discuss strategies and what to do next. So being the first uh, gave him a position where he had to or he was able to provide leadership for the whole country for those that came behind him. Okay. Um, yeah, what was Carl Stokes' relationship with William O. Walker? I know the two were close while Stokes mm -hmm. was mayor later the parted ways. Well, uh, William O. Walker, of course, was a, kind of a legendary publisher of the Call and Post newspaper. He's one of the uh, really successful black newspapers in the country. And uh, William O. Walker, of course, was very much committed to developing black businesses as much as possible. And uh, when Carl Stokes ran for mayor, back throughout his political career, uh, Walker, you know, you know reported on him favorably, the newspaper did. Uh, Walker also 
you know, was very strong in, in politics. He was almost the arbiter of who could run where. Uh, when you had two strong black politicians running for the same suit, uh, seat, Walker might call them in and have a meeting with them and to decide right there which one should run and which one should drop out because the call and post was so powerful in the community at that time that uh, getting support from Walker was good for any politician and being criticized by Walker was a problem. So. Uh, when Carl Stokes ran for, I guess when he ran for the legislature, he got favorable write-ups in, in the call-in post from Walker, and they remained in touch. And I think that, I'm guessing I had that William Walker saw what I think was very obvious to people who were alert to these things. And Carl Stokes had special skills in politics that were far above those of the uh, most of the other politicians and uh, he backed him very much so when Carl ran for mayor Walker uh, backed him fully he had would run favorable stories on the front page of the call post and played a major role in organizing the community and getting the community aware making them aware of what who, what he was doing, what was at stake. And you could say that without the Call and Post newspaper's contribution that probably Carl never would have been elected mayor. And uh, of course they remained in consultation with each other, uh, you know, from then all the time he was mayor. And uh, if there was really something that Stokes had to get out to the community and there was no good way for him to, just calling a press conference and making a general announcement wouldn't have the right impact or when he wanted to get something known that he didn't want his uh, fingerprints on he could leak it to the call and post and it knew it would be handled properly gotten out uh, so the call and post was a major factor in Stokes being elected mayor and also was a uh, certainly very advantageous to Stokes in keeping the community together as he governed the city. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. You know, William Walker's a Republican, but I guess it's. Yeah, William Walker was a total dyed in the wool Republican, but he was, I guess, what you would call a practical Republican or a strategic Republican. That is, he uh, knew that his uh, alignment and his connections required him to be a strong Republican, but at the same time, he was very active uh, unofficially in the Black Democratic politics. The newspaper made that so he always put the community you know he used it tried to use his republicanism and certainly in the pages of his paper to advance what he would do what he thought was advancing the community there were people who differed with him about a lot of things and argued with him about a lot of things but yeah he he was a republican that did not mean that he therefore was just out to destroy every Democrat. And he, he wanted the community to win. Okay. Um, yeah, so Stokes pioneered an early notion of what we call environmental justice. So how impactful was in environmental policies on Cleveland and nationwide, which recently received renewed attention from the uh, National Park Service? Well, the uh, Cleveland was an environmental mess, of course, when Stokes was elected. Uh, it was one of the world's great industrial cities, and all the uh, pollution attendant to that was visible everywhere in Cleveland. The Lake Erie was, they said it was dying. It actually was in serious decline. It 
Uh, when I first came to Cleveland in the 1950s, people boasted about the Lake Erie whitefish and so on. By the time Carl Stokes got elected, uh, people were afraid to eat fish out of Lake Erie because of the pollution. The Cuyahoga River, the big industrial river that fed into the lake, was a smelly, horrible mess. It was almost like an open sewer. As with, because of all the industrial waste from the factories along the river, the steel mills and all. So, uh, in 1969, an oil slick on the river caught fire and made big international news. And Cleveland became known as the city with the burning river. The river's so dirty that it burns. And uh, it, it just was a major uh, story and really put a brand on Cleveland. Well, Carl Stokes took advantage of that uh, to really begin a, the cleanup of the area, cleanup of the river and cleanup of the lake. He created something called the Clean Water Task Force. Of course, he had federal funds. He had access to the federal funds. And they developed programs to fight the pollution going into the Cuyahoga River uh, that, that said was the forerunner to the National Environmental Protective Protection Associate uh, Agency. Uh, that Cleveland had the first EPA is the way it's put. I don't know if that's completely accurate to say it because I haven't researched all that. But because of what or what Stokes did in fighting pollution in the Cuyahoga River did become a model that was picked up and it really was a shot in the arm for the whole environmental movement. Before that time, environmentalists were people on the sidelines whining about the destruction that nobody seemed to care about very much. But after uh, the river burned and Stokes got involved as mayor of Cleveland, environmentalism kind of shifted into a mainstream, respectable goal. So in that sense, it, uh, Cleveland played a major role in, in the, just creating the awareness mm -hmm. and giving impetus to the whole national effort to begin the environmental protection. Um, oh, yeah, you said this off-camera last time we met. Can you recount the story of a white mob that attempted to march to Carl Stokes' home on March Mayor? Yeah, yeah. Uh, back, I believe it was 1969. I think it was near 69 or 70. No, no. 69. 69. Uh, back on in, in, in the neighborhood of Woodland Avenue, around 110th Street on up to the Shaker Heights line. Uh, it was a white neighborhood that black people were just beginning to move into around the time of Stokes election. And it was a very hostile neighborhood. They did not want black people in the neighborhood. People were attacked on the streets and took a lot of effort. Well, Woodland Avenue, Going all the way up to the Cleveland line at that time, they've changed the name since, but going all the way up to the Cleveland line, it was Woodland Avenue. And then when it crossed into Shaker Heights, it became Larchmere Boulevard. And it had very nice Shaker Heights style homes. Well, actually, excuse me, it wasn't in Shaker Heights. It was, it came across Southmoreland Boulevard going into Shaker Heights, not quite there, still a piece of, it was a piece of Cleveland. The next block was still Cleveland before it became Shaker Heights, but it was called Larchmere Boulevard. But it was just an extension of Woodland Avenue that changed names. But the section of Cleveland that I'm talking about, that block had nice, luxurious homes, the kind that would fit into Shaker Heights, you know, and that's where the Stokes family lived. In fact, a lot of uh, public officials in Cleveland would live there because they could have the voting uh, residence in Cleveland at that address, but have the amenities of a suburb 
And it, even though it was in the city of Cleveland, it was in the Shaker Heights School District. So uh, they kind of had the best of both worlds. Okay, so that's where Carl Stokes lived. There was no real big problem with him living there. Uh, although his son was harassed on the street sometimes. But you go back down to 110th Street in Woodland, there it was a kind of low income white neighborhood or much of it was low income family. And there were projects there, white projects. And uh, it was not a safe area for black people. So one day, two black teenagers whose family had just moved in the neighborhood were walking down the street. And there were all these white teenagers playing baseball in the, in the field. And when they saw these two black kids, they ran to attack them. And one of the attackers had a baseball bat and he was going to swing it at one of the kids. Well, the kid pulled the knife out and stabbed him. And the white man died. The white kid died there. Uh, the two blacks were arrested and charged with murder. But uh, that was another story. Um, but the white community then in that area got very worked up. They're very angry about the death. That night, a mob formed at 110th and Woodland, and the police said it was at least 200 people or more. And they decided to march up Woodland Avenue onto a large mirror to get the mayor, I guess to lynch the mayor or whatever. And as they started marching up the street, the police said they couldn't stop them, said the mayor should evacuate his house because they can't hold back the mob. And the uh, funny thing was, these were white police, of course, who were saying that they couldn't hold back the mob. All of the black police in town well, immediately rushed to the mayor's house. They, there was only one radio band at that time, and everybody could hear on the police radio what was going on. And so the black policemen just said, I'm going to the mayor's house. They didn't ask permission, but they all rushed there. Uh, the Meanwhile, the police who were uh, saying the mob was out of control, they couldn't hold them back. They kept saying, evacuate the mayor's house, evacuate the mayor's house. Mayor Stokes said he would not be evacuated. And he and his family had their lights out. They were lying on the floor of the house but they expected the mob to be stopped. And uh, they say the white police were saying it could not be stopped. Well, as they got up to South Moreland Avenue, the corner street just before he entered the mayor's block, uh, the black policemen sent word that if they came into the block, they would open up with automatic weapon fire. And at that point, the mob was turned back, and they never came into the block. But that uh, that's a part of Cleveland history. For some reason, it didn't get legs, and it's not well known. But the mayor survived a lynch mob because the black police and a few uh, the county sheriff, deputy sheriffs who were out also rushed to the mayor's house and threatened to use machine guns to stop the mob. Mm -hmm. Now that was a, a situation and a culture that fortunately younger people know nothing about, even though they, we can talk about prejudice and discrimination now. Uh, the reality of what the pioneers had to face, you know, Stokes as a political pioneer, was far, far, uh, unlike anything that we see today, it was far more dangerous. And it, it took a toll on him, I think, took a toll on his family, but uh, that's the way in which the change came about. Okay, out of curiosity, what happened to the two boys? That were... Okay, what happened to the two boys? They mm -hmm. charged with murder, they stayed in jail, county jail for a year held without bond two teenagers held in jail without bond for an entire year 
They finally came to trial and they were acquitted. It was a clear case of self-defense. But the county prosecutor kept them confined in jail for a whole year, even though all the elements of self-defense were present. And fortunately, their lawyers were able to, to uh, convince the jury uh, of what really happened. And they got a, I don't, I've always wondered what happened to them afterward. And I've never heard. They, that was, but those were two young people who went through a literal hell that they should not have gone through because of the prejudice of the police and the prosecutors. 